I played last night, uh, as well as um, some other current projects and just sort of my practice in general. Um, so uh, the first off, I'd like to say thanks to Thorsten um, for uh, putting this event together. Um, it's really just been a dream uh, the whole weekend and the staff here have just been uh, really awesome to work with. Um, so yeah, it's, this has been a really special weekend and I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, so the piece I played last night, um, the way that was uh, put together uh, in broad strokes, um, there was a source file, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later, how, how that was created. Um, and that file's not in the piece at all, but what the piece consists of um, is about 50-some uh, uh, reconstructions of that uh, source file that were spread out around uh, the speaker array. Um, and so it was about uh, actually over 27 hours of audio that's um, being used to create the piece in different, uh, out of those 50 plus voices, um, you know, various ones are being muted or activated uh, at different times. Um, and about 30 or 40 uh, voices are in play at um, any given time. So the way the source file was reconstructed to create what you hear in the piece um, was largely done through uh, music information retrieval tools. Um, there's a toolkit in Super Collider um, called SCMIR for Super Collider Music Information Retrieval, um, so straightforwardly enough. Um, and so what those tools do is um, extract um, feature data from a file. And there are um, a lot of different ones in this toolkit. So there's some of the ones that were used in the piece to uh, extract data were uh, perceptual loudness. Um, so that's a little different from pure amplitude because uh, of the way the uh, human he hearing apparatus is, uh, has different sensitivities to different frequency levels. Um, spectral entropy is another, um, and spectral entropy is sort of a measure of the, the spikiness of the uh, harmonic distribution of a sound. So uh, a tonal sound, like more spikiness equals lower entropy, basically. So white noise would be high entropy, and something uh, that's just like uh, more tonal would be low entropy. Uh, spectral centroid uh, was another one. Uh, so that just grabs the weighted mean frequency, which corresponds perceptually to brightness, basically. So the higher the weighted mean frequency, more or less, the, the brighter the sound is. So there are about 10 of these uh, that were used to um, extract data um, from the source file. And then there's a, a library of about 400 waveforms that I would perform the same feature extraction on and then go through the source file frame by frame and find the closest match from that uh, library of waveforms. Um, so what's happening is there's a, with the source file, there is you know potentially infinite variation in those waveforms and that variation is getting slotted into one of 400 uh, slots, depending on the search criteria. Um, so it is um, effectively like a reduction in complexity of the sound, although perceptually, um, sometimes the it sounds more complex because it's um, there are more events that we can actually discern and pick up. Um, so just by analogy, like if cat is the source file, depending on like the algorithm that you're using, um, any of the words on the right might be the closest match. 
So if you were looking for geometrical similarity, like oat would be the closest word. Um, if like semantic adjacency was what you were uh, waiting in your search, then feline would make the most sense. Um, phonetically, pat is, is closest to cat. Um, act has the highest number of identical letters. Um, so that's sort of what's going on in, in the way that the, the sound is, is being pulled out and recreated. And each of those terms on the right sort of leads in very different directions and has very different uh, implications for structuring meaning. So I'll play you um, a short excerpt from the source file. Um, so this source file was created uh, using a recurrent neural network online, sample RNN, um, which I fed just several hours of uh, performances that I had done um, in about the year and a half uh, before the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like really super unpleasant to listen to and uh, kind of uh, very low sound quality. It sounds like a, a maybe a voicemail from a very windy place. Um, but when I, when I was developing this process, you know, I tried using different kinds of files and there was something about what happened with um, this kind of sound when it was transformed that I, I thought uh, could lead to something. So I'll let you hear uh, some of the variations that came from that. So this is from the same spot in the file, so all versions of... So those all came out of that. So I'll go into the number 12 and, and talk about how that um, variation was made. Um, one toolkit that I used a lot in this process was called Flucoma. And if you were here for Lauren Sarah Hayes' talk yesterday, um, she uses that as well. Um, flucoma is short for fluid corpus manipulation. And um, it's a great toolbox if you're a computer musician and don't have a PhD in computer science, because uh, it makes a lot of um, some signal decomposition and machine learning techniques um, accessible uh, for musical use. Uh, it was developed by uh, Pierre Tremblay and a team at uh, the University of Huddersfield in England, um, James Bradbury, who engineered uh, the online collaborative tool um, with Mark Fell and Ryan Trienor that uh, they were using yesterday and today, um, is also part of that team. Um, so he's a wizard. Um, so one of the techniques in the Flucoma toolkit is non-negative matrix factorization. Um, the way that works is it splits up uh, sound into different bands or components, um, but it, unlike FFT or DWT uh, or other analysis techniques, it doesn't segregate the sound by frequency, it just divides the uh, energy of the sound into um, somewhat random bands. Um, just I made an illustration here, splitting it in uh, sound into two components, just to sort of give you a sense of how this works. So here's the original sound. <laughs> And so here's one of the two components. Uh, 
And so you can hear it's, you know, it's not just the low bands or the high bands. There's the entire frequency spectrum is there, but it, there's, there's something missing. There's some sort of porosity in the, the, the spectrum. Here's the other half of the sound. Here's what's missing. So they're perceptually pretty similar. I don't know if, I think maybe if you listened really closely several times, maybe you could find some differences between the two. But then when you sum those two sounds, it, we're back to where we started. And then the interesting thing about non-negative matrix factorization is that um, you know, if you run it multiple times on the same file, you'll get different results every time. There's not, um, yeah, it's a, it's a form of unsupervised learning that, by which it uh, analyzes the sound. So for that version number 12, the 12th variation, um, first I made a 64 component NMF. That's, so that's one band. Uh, oops. Um, so, so that was, um, let's see if I can get, yeah. There were times, there were a couple of times when I was working on this piece when like someone would like drag something on a cart on the sidewalk outside uh, my apartment and I thought I had left the system running. Um, so the first step was to create the NMF and then pull the loudness and the spectral centroid data uh, from each of those 64 components. Um, and then for the amplitude of the 64 bands, I just used uh, FFT and, and reused the am amplitude envelopes. So having done those steps, that got me to this sound. So um, that's pretty different. There's a lot going on there. Um, the next step, I used another uh, object from the Flucoma toolkit um, to segment the file into novelty slices. Um, and I wanted to do that in order to only, to only use the waveforms from the onset of each novelty slice so that the, there's, it wouldn't be just waggling all over the place like it was in the last example. The novelty slices in Flucoma are based on self-similarity. So at points of uh, significant change in the file, um, it will designate that as, as a, a new segment. So it's different from like onset detection or um, things like that in that there's not like a specific um, like auditory cue that the that it's searching for, it's using the, the file itself as the model to determine like when uh, something changes. So it could be a, a, the onset of uh, like a, a, an amplitude attack, or it might be uh, just harmonic change. Um, and it has like various parameters that you can sort of play around with until you find, you know, results that are perceptually uh, relevant or you know, otherwise desirable, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, so once we did that, then we got this out of it. And then I wanted to slow it down just um, to be able to hear more of the detail in that. And then I wanted to like, get rid of some of the higher resonance in there, so I just shifted some of the um, frequency and amplitude bins uh, from the FFT analysis. And so that was the final um, version that ended up in the piece. Uh, so I, one thing that's attractive to me about these tools is just that they um, rearrange sounds in ways that would be very counterintuitive. Um, to human ears. And uh, there is a Jorge Luis Borges story 
called The Analytical Language of John Wilkins. And in that story, uh, he talks about a fictitious Chinese encyclopedia in which it is written that animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, C, tame, D, sucking pigs, E, sirens, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in the present classification, I, frenzied, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, L, etc., M, having just broken the water pitcher, N, that from a long way off look like flies. And so Michel Foucault, in his book, The Order of Things, he talks about this story and how delightful it was to him um, because this sort of fictitious example of this exotic system of thought, uh, he thought, served to illustrate some of the limitations of our own in that it would just be impossible to really think up this uh, taxonomy if you were starting from like, you know, Enlightenment European uh, rationality. Um, and so just as, you know, this would be impossible to think, I've, um, I think of these uh, machine listening tools as, as kind of bringing to us things that are impossible to hear um, in ways that are different from, say, a microphone or a telephone or maybe a seismograph that maybe amplify or transport sounds that um, would, uh, would be audible if they were here. But they, these actually create these um, sort of exotic taxonomies of sound. Um, so I will share with you a clip from another piece that uses um, the same technique um, this was included in a compilation that was just released um, as a tribute to Peter Rayberg. Um, anyway, here's, here's, uh, here that is. So, um, another current project um, that I've used that uh, employs machine listening uh, was a piece called Every Single Person Has Some Muscle. Um, this is actually uh, being released on CD next week uh, on the Flea label. Um, this is um, a piece that is entirely composed of synthetic speech. Um, it's a reinterpretation of another piece um, by Jack Callahan and Jeff Witcher called What Happens on Earth Stays on Earth. And um, those artists are, are friends of mine. They asked me to reinterpret uh, the piece for them, um, which the original piece is um, based on interviews with six people, asking them questions like, what makes you happy? What makes you unhappy? Um, share a, a favorite story from your childhood. Uh, and so when I set about working on this piece, um, 
I've had a long-standing fascination with sort of creatively mishearing things, which is, is something that I'm prone to, where like the song on the radio says, you know, there's a bad moon on the rise, and I hear there's a, a bathroom on the right, or something like that. And so this sort of um, concurrence of kind of phonetic proximity with semantic uh, incongruity, uh, there's something musical about that to me that I really like. Um, so, uh, to make this piece, I ran the um, original spoken responses to the questions from the uh, original piece just through Microsoft Word dictation. And so I would... Um, each time, you know, the dictation software, as I'm sure anyone who's used uh, speech-to-text, uh, it doesn't work perfectly, you know, by a long shot. And so there are always um, mistranslations. So I had each of the six original speakers um, create uh, synthetic versions of their voices using this software called Descript. And uh, so once I had uh, speech-to-text of the original speech, I would run, I, I would play, replay the translated speech using the synthetic voice. And I would do that process iteratively, like seven times. I would do four streams of seven translations. So by the, the end of that process, I would have, um, you know, some pretty garbled uh, stuff to work with. Um, and in that process, I learned to sort of play Microsoft Word like an instrument um, and to sort of be able to control the rate of mistranslation by controlling the amount of background noise uh, in the environment and sometimes the playback speed of the voice. And so I could just like run my fingernails over the computer keys sometimes and that would just create enough sort of noise in the background to maybe accelerate uh, the, the mistranslations. Um, so yeah, um, so it's similar to the piece I played last night in that it involves taking this sort of continuous sonic stream and then imposing a sort of top-down discrete um, model on it that um, creates these sort of uh, quantization errors, I guess you could say. Um, So one of the respondents, in, in answer to one of his questions, um, I think the question was, you know, what's something about you that other people find annoying? Um, he talked about his sort of inability to hear other people, which I think I thought served as a um, neat encapsulation of a lot of my uh, motivations for creating the piece. So I'll play you a couple of excerpts from that. Ask people to repeat themselves in lobby. Ask people to repeat themselves left. I guess people to repeat those other light. I ask people to think about why. In. A lot. I ask people to repeat themselves a lot. Because I have a hard time. As I had a hard time. From that hard time. Because I had a hard time. Period. During. Hearing. Hearing and they say it. Hearing what they're saying. But sometimes, sometimes they have, they have, have to, to ask us. And sometimes I'll have to ask them four or five times keep himself keep himself to keep themselves times to repeat themselves to repeat themselves and i will actually have to speak back phone actually his feedback to them, to them to occur, confirm confirm what they're actually telling me to avoid a circumcision avoid certain to avoid a sort of kitchen to avoid any sort of confusion um and I'll play one more excerpt from that. Uh, this is, uh, there were some tongue twisters as well as part of the um, answers that the respondents gave. Um, and so this is from the blokes, bikes, back, brake, blocks, broke. 
Looks like that great flux birthday books bikes back break blocks broke the books by steps first Wexford books by Saxbury Fox boat trip like that break cluster of the books by tax break blocks broke the books by tax break blocks for the books transferring Foxford clips looks like stacked reflex birthday books bikes tax prefix wrote the books bikes next prefix birthday books by tax free fox bullet looks like factoring flexor of the closed pipe stacks reflex wrote the books bikes next first blocks for the book tax free fox sports for looks like stacked break blocks bird that looks like stacks reflex broke the books by stacks prefix birthday books by fax free fox bullet looks like stacked reflex birthday quotes pipe stacks for flood rosa close fights back break blocks road blocks fights back break blocks broken Blood spikes back break blocks broke the blows spike back break blocks for the blood fights back break block broke blocks by backspace brooks close the bold strikes back look spikes back break blocks broke blocks spikes back break blocks broken folks spikes back breaks last broken blow slides back break block through the word flights backgrounds block works words by backspace the boat strikes back book spikes back break blocks broke blood spikes back break blocks broke the close slides back break last broke the blow slide back break blocks broke word files after a block workflow side backspace the boat strikes back back break blocks breath looks like staff break block broken blood spikes after its last over blow side factor faster faster growth spikes back strike last make box sports book bites blocks broke both sides back break box broke Books like back break last broke the book flag staff word blocks book globe spikes background fox bird the books by factory crossword book 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 sites background foster the brookside back break ducks but the bog bites bath row box broke both spikes back break blocks for the books by factory crossbow to blow flag staff spikes back break box for the brookside back break box broke the book by factory fox broke spikes back break box bird the books like backwards box start the book bites back break blocks broke bloke spikes pathway fox bird the book flights back break blocks bird word spikes back road blocks for the books that's it. Um, thanks. That's <laughs> so that's all I had <laughs> prepped, but yeah, thanks for listening. Um, we have some time if you want to take any questions, if there's, if there's any questions in the room. Any, any hands? All right. See Robert after if there is. Cool. Thanks so much. That was wonderful.